on World News Tonight. Live attack. Former politician and his brother in India shot dead on live television during an interview. Clashes in Sudan. East African country descends into violence after a brief humanitarian pause. Mass shooting. A sweet 16th birthday not so sweet in Alabama as four people reported dead in an attack. Celebrating nation. A mass dance party takes place in North Korea in celebration of the tale founder. This is Adha Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Sanuvi Mudanayaka. Good evening and you are watching World News. Tonight's broadcast has a number of stories regarding escalating violence around the globe. We start off in India as a former Indian politician convicted of kidnapping was shot dead live on television along with his brother Ait Ahmed, who has been under police escort, was talking to reporters when a gun was pulled close to his head in Pragrad, also known as Allahabad. The following visuals of this story is graphic. Viewer discretion is strictly advised. This was the moment before Atik Ahmed, a former lawmaker in India's parliament convicted of kidnapping, was shot dead along with his brother on live TV. It was while police were escorting them for a medical checkup on Saturday. A gunman is seen reaching over the shoulders of police to point a pistol at the Temple of Ahmed, whose turban is blown off as the gun discharges. His brother, Ashraf Ahmed, was shot a split second later. Local police commissioner Ramit Sharma said the media were interviewing the brothers as police took them for mandatory health checks. Three men posing as media members started firing, he said. One surrendered immediately after the shooting, while officers subdued the other two suspects. The victims died within minutes. The dramatic footage of the men being killed was shared across broadcast channels and social media. The state government, controlled by Prime Minister Narendra Modi's Hindu Nationalist Party, has ordered a judicial probe into the killings. After carrying out the shooting, the suspects shouted Hindu religious chants. Fearing violent unrest in the wake of the killings, the Uttar Pradesh government barred gatherings of more than four people across the state. Gun violence has been escalating in the recent past in the US. There was a devastating shooting that broke out at a 16th birthday party in Alabama over the weekend and authorities were imploring people to come forward with information about the four people being killed. A shooting at a Sweet 16 birthday party in Alabama on Saturday left at least four people dead and more than 20 others injured. It's the latest in a series of recent high-profile shootings in the U.S. South, including killings in Tennessee and Kentucky. On Saturday, in the Alabama town of Dadeville, shots were heard inside a dance studio shortly after 10.30 at night as the birthday celebration was underway. Officials said Sunday there was no longer any threat to the community, but did not say whether a suspect has been killed or arrested. There was also no official word on any shooter's motive. Residents gathered on Sunday evening near the crime scene for a prayer vigil. Fred Hutcherson is a local pastor. Officials said counseling would be provided at schools in the area on Monday. President Joe Biden said in a statement on Sunday, quote, guns are the leading killer of children in America, and what has our nation come to when children cannot attend a birthday party without fear? Biden also urged Congress to tighten the country's gun control laws, saying it was within their power to do so. The Pentagon is working intensively to identify how a massive trove of classified information was leaked, revealing secrets about U.S. military support for Ukraine, among other critical geopolitical issues, and to minimize growing anger from some of America's closest partners whose own intelligence operations may have been jeopardized. Adding to these concerns, lawmakers from both parties also expressed their outrage, citing the Biden administration's gross negligence to national security being the root cause of the matter. 
As accused leaker Jack Teixeira awaits a detention hearing Wednesday, lawmakers expressing outrage, calling the leaks inexplicable, given that the man accused of releasing the documents was a 21-year-old Air National Guardsman working on a remote base in Massachusetts. Meanwhile, a leaked U.S. intelligence report published by the Washington Post, but not seen by NBC News, says the Russian government believes its disinformation operations on American social media are hugely successful, boasting that networks detect Russian bots just 1% of the time. Experts are wondering whether Teixeira is emblematic of a new risk. He allegedly uploaded the documents to the gaming platform Discord, which is so popular with young people that the military has even used it as a recruiting tool. An official Pentagon guide to Discord urged military members, don't post anything in Discord that you wouldn't want seen by the general public. Teixeira's friends say he lived by a different code, sharing secrets to impress them. Individuals have access to much more information. Part of this is an overcorrection from 9-11, where, as you know, the problem was too much information was too compartmented. And so there was a need to share more. The chairman of the House Intelligence Committee saying the alleged leaker could have been stopped. The Sudanese army pounded paramilitary bases with airstrikes as the power struggle continued to rage in the North African nation. Sudan's army appeared to have gained the upper hand. The latest report from local and international independent media stated that the death toll climbed to 97, including UN workers. After a day of tense fighting, Sudan's army appeared to make strides Sunday against a deadly power struggle with rival paramilitary forces, blasting their bases with airstrikes. Dozens of civilians have been killed in the clashes, including three UN workers. Fire and plumes of black smoke could be seen across Khartoum's skyline. Satellite images showed airplanes burning at Khartoum International Airport, as well as fires near a hospital. Both sides agreed to a three-hour humanitarian pause, a deal suggested by the United Nations. While firing appeared initially to subside, witness that heavy bombardments took place shortly afterwards. Gunfire could also be heard in the capital. <laughs> Sudan's former Prime Minister, Abdallah Hamdok, called for an immediate ceasefire, allowing for a humanitarian corridor. <laughs> Doctors' unions had said earlier it was difficult for medics and the sick to get to and from hospitals. The violence, which began Saturday, was sparked by a disagreement over the integration of the RSF into the military as part of a transition towards civilian rule. It is the first such outbreak since 2019, when both groups joined forces to oust veteran Islamist autocrat Omar al-Bashir. The United States, China, Russia, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, the UN Security Council, European Union and African Union have appealed for a quick end to the hostilities. They say the fighting threatens to worsen instability in an already volatile wider region. The lawyer of an Australian charged with foreign interference said his client had become very worried about two alleged foreign intelligence agents while living in Shanghai and returned to Australia after a decade-long career in China. Marketing executive Alexander Sergo was arrested in the beachside suburb of Bondi and is the second person charged under the Australian's Foreign Interference Law, which criminalizes activities that help a foreign power interfere with Australia's sovereignty or national interest. It carries a 15-year prison sentence. Sergo is alleged to have accepted cash for writing reports which Australian Federal Police say contain information about Australian defence, economic and national security arrangements. His defence lawyer Bernard Collery sought bail in court today at a Sydney local court, saying the reports Sergo had written were based on publicly sourced information and the case against his client was shallow and unsubstantiated. Sir Go is alleged to have intentionally engaged in conduct on behalf or in collaboration with persons acting on behalf of a principal and was reckless as to whether the conduct would support intelligence activities of a foreign principal and a part of the conduct was covered or involved deception. A court attendance notice showed. Collery said Sergo's career had come tumbling down since the arrest and he had no intention to return to China and instead planned to pursue the Australian government for damages for ruining his career. We we'll are back with more world news after this short commercial break.
Welcome back. Nationalist governments in Poland and Hungary have banned imports of Ukrainian grain and other products to protect their farmers. The EU has condemned the member states' unilateral moves. Poland and Hungary have banned imports of grain and other foods from Ukraine to protect their farmers. A European Commission spokesperson on Sunday condemned the, quote, unacceptable unilateral actions on trade by the two member states. Russia's invasion of Ukraine last year blocked some Black Sea ports, leaving large quantities of Ukrainian grain, which is cheaper than that produced in the European Union, in Central European states due to logistical bottlenecks. That knocked prices and sales for local farmers, angering Poland's ruling Law and Justice Party, which has a big rural support base, in an election year. The Polish ban, which came into effect on Saturday evening, will also apply to the transit of these products through the country, the Development and Technology Minister said on Sunday. Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban's government followed suit, but did not say when its ban would come into effect. Kiev said the Polish ban contradicted bilateral agreements and called for talks to settle the issue. Ukraine exports most of its agricultural goods, especially grain, via its Black Sea ports, which were unblocked in July under an agreement between Ukraine, Turkey, Russia and the United Nations. The group of seven rich nations set big new collective targets for solar power and offshore wind capacity, agreeing to speed up renewable energy development and move toward a quicker phase out of fossil fuels. G7 ministers have set big new targets for solar power and offshore wind. Climate and energy ministers agreed on Sunday to speed up both developing clean energy and phasing out fossil fuels after two days of talks in the Japanese city of Sapporo. Renewable fuel sources and energy security have taken on a new urgency following the Ukraine war. But the climate and energy ministers stopped short of agreeing a 2030 deadline to phase out coal, which Canada and other members had pushed for. And they left the door open for continuing to invest in gas, saying it could help ease energy shortfalls. Japan's trade and industry minister, Yasutoshi Nishimura. In the G7 meeting, we acknowledged that different countries around the world have various economic and energy situations, and the path to carbon neutrality by 2050 should be diverse. The important thing is to aim towards net zero, our common goal, and that was recognised. The G7 communique pledged to collectively increase offshore wind capacity by 150 gigawatts by 2030 and solar capacity to more than one terawatt, which they called a drastic rise in clean power. They agreed to accelerate phasing out unabated fossil fuels. That is, the burning of fossil fuels without using technology to capture the resulting CO2 emissions. That would achieve net zero in energy systems by 2050 at the latest, the ministers said promising concrete and timely steps towards scrapping coal. Canada said unabated coal-fired power should be phased out by 2030. And Ottawa, Britain and some other G7 members committed to that date, Canada's Minister of Natural Resources Jonathan Wilkinson told. Additional plastic pollution should be cut to zero by 2040, they said, bringing the target forward by a decade. A North Korean patrol ship crossed over the de facto border in waters west of the Korean peninsula. The South Korean Navy fired warning shots. The North Korean ship appeared to be pursuing Chinese fishing boats in the area. A ship from the South Korean Navy fired near a dozen warning shots after a North Korean patrol boat crossed over the de facto border in the waters west of the peninsula on Saturday morning. The ship from the north crossed over the maritime border, dubbed the Northern Limit Line, or NLL, and sailed for almost two kilometers into the south's waters. The ship stayed south of the line for about 10 minutes before retreating. The Joint Chiefs of Staff said Sunday that they're not sure as to why, but they see it as unlikely to be an intentional provocation from the north. The ship could have been chasing down some Chinese fishing boats, they said, judging by how it was tailing some Chinese ships as it zigzagged through the sea. The South Korean Navy fired warning shots only when the North Korean ship remained unresponsive to multiple communication attempts. The military also said that the South Korean ship crashed into a Chinese boat during the incident, causing several injuries. 
Three South Korean sailors are currently in hospital, with one getting treated for what's reported to be a collarbone injury. The JCS said there was poor visibility at the time, with sailors only being able to see about 90 meters ahead. The day of this latest event also happens to be the birthday of the regime's late founder, Kim Il-sung, and it's North Korea's biggest national holiday. The North had also crossed the northern limit line six months ago. However, that crossing was seen as clearly intentional. It also came closer to the brink of a heated clash, with warning shots fired from both the North and the South. Some experts worry that North Korea is going to use this latest incident as pretext to once again bring up their discontent over the NLL, which they have never recognized as a fair border. Just a few months after NASA introduced the world to the most powerful rocket ever flown to orbit, Elon Musk's SpaceX is prepared to set off its own creation, which could pack nearly twice the power of anything flown before. SpaceX's vehicle called Starship is currently sitting on a launch pad at the company's facilities on the South Texas coastline. The dawn of a new era in space exploration could take off in a matter of hours. SpaceX's Starship, the most powerful rocket in the world, standing nearly 400 feet tall, scheduled for liftoff Monday morning in its first uncrewed orbital test flight that SpaceX plans to live stream. It's part of founder and CEO Elon Musk's years-long vision of getting back to the moon and then traveling to Mars. Life can't just be about solving problems. They have to be things that inspire you. Musk responding by tweet to the news Friday that the FAA signed off on the launch license. Success, maybe. Excitement, guaranteed. The groundbreaking process has seen the company reach its altitude goals before, but experienced some fiery landings. Previous test flights have all remained in Earth's atmosphere. Until now, Starship is set to circle the globe and splash down in the Pacific, the 90-minute trip that could shape interplanetary travel for generations. South Korea's mission to be carbon neutral by 2050 continues and in fact is more active than ever. One ongoing project is renovating old buildings to make them more eco-friendly. In order to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050, South Korea must reduce greenhouse gas emissions from buildings, which accounted for one-fourth of the country's total emissions by 32.8 percent compared to 2018 figures by 2030. But this is not an easy task as many older buildings weren't built to current standards that take emissions into account. With these older buildings in mind, the Ministry of Land, Infrastructure and Transport launched a project to support those who plan to participate in green remodeling, which aims to improve the environment indoors while reducing greenhouse gas emissions from buildings. Installing solar panels helped transform this office into a more eco-friendly place. In particular, the Building Integrated Photovoltaic, or BIPV system on the exterior walls not only saves energy, but also enhances the appearance of the structure. It also has a building energy management system to monitor and control the building's energy needs. This daycare center is a much cozier place for children during the winter since going green. An energy-efficient thermopane window using low emissivity glass allows sunlight in during winter and keeps heat inside. In summer, the windows block out heat while still letting in natural light. We used to consume around 14,000 kilowatt hour of electricity per month, but after going green, it went down by 2,000. This place was freezing during the winter, but now it's so cozy and warm that even the kids can run around barefoot. This eco-friendly university library improved its energy efficiency by 50 percent compared to before. It uses a heat recovery ventilator to improve indoor air quality by replacing stale indoor air with fresh air from outside. Starting this year, the green remodeling project for public buildings has expanded to senior centers and public libraries. As for the private sector, the government decided to provide more financial aid to participants. About 12,000 private buildings undergo green remodeling annually. But last year, due to the rate hikes, there were fewer participants. So this year, the government is focusing more on private buildings. He added that green remodeling has become more attractive these days as energy bills rise. Welcome back. For more news, let's take care on the world in a minute. Wildfire.
fires raging along the French Spanish border have burned at least 750 hectares of land on both sides. The blaze started in southern France and crossed to the Spanish side. Japanese and South Korean Foreign and Defense Ministry officials arrived in Seoul to kickstart security talks today, the first of such meetings between the country in five years. Brazilian President Lula da Silva again proposed establishing a group of countries not involved in the Russian Ukraine war to broker peace, saying he had discussed the matter with Chinese counterpart Xi Jinping. 130 Ukrainian prisoners of war have been released and returned home in a Great Easter exchange. It was not clear how many Russians were sent back the other way. Ukrainian and Russian forces have held regular prisoner exchange during the Moscow's invasion. Now it's the 14th month. One of the most prominent democracy activists in Hong Kong over recent years, Joshua Wong, was sentenced today to three months in prison over an information breach involving a police officer. That is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you miss any of the stories tonight, you can watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And we end tonight with visuals of North Korea celebrating the 111th birthday of the state's founder with a massive dance party and fireworks in Pyongyang. Thank you for watching. Good night.